Good morning, everybody. Um, I don't quite know why I was volunteered to do the doom and gloom slot, but uh, those who know me probably can recognise this. Um, so I've been asked to do fit, an, fit in an awful lot into 15 minutes. So apologies if I kind of skate over some of the arguments, but I guess many of the people in this room kind of know where we're coming from. Um, and I'm partly reusing slides that I've used before just to make a point that things are, are kind of embedded. And the first point here is these four pictures were taken from the news on the same day when it was rare that we had floods in the UK, floods in Venice, <coughs> wildfires in California, and wildfires in Australia. That was four years ago, if I remember, just before the pandemic. Now, it's completely unremarkable. I could do those four pictures every year since this first happened. But we are in a world where the climate is changing very fast, the environment is changing very fast. As Susanna said, the politics is changing very fast. So, again, apologies for people who've seen this slide innumerable times. Um, why are we in this mess? We are in this mess because over the last 50 or 60 years, we have effectively designed a food system to be super efficient but super fragile and super um, uh, uh, unsustainable. And I'm just going to kind of talk through this quickly. I say that it's kind of based around the ideology of the food system that our job is to provide food ever more available, ever cheaper, and so on. And I call that the cheaper food paradigm. So just starting in a random place, we know that the, the food system is driving greenhouse gases. 33% of all emissions are coming from the food system now, driving climate change. As the climate changes, we're saying, oh, my God, yields are going down. We have to intensify our food system because yields are going down. As yields go down, we say, oh, my God, we need more food. Let's expand our agricultural area. So uh, that drives biodiversity loss, et cetera. Biodiversity dro loss drives yields down and so on. And of course... As we grow more food at greater volumes and greater scale, of course, that incentivizes converting land from forest into uh, agricultural systems, a uh, direct change. As we drive climate change, we're saying, oh, my God, we need land to store our carbon. So whether it's biomass uh, with um, uh, uh, carbon capture and storage or wh whatever, bio bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or whether it's planting trees or whatever, we're saying, oh, we need more land for that. As we do that, we change where uh, crops are grown, we change uh, land use that uh, uh, creates emissions from the, from the ground, which drives climate change a bit more. And we say, oh, my God, we need to grow more food. Uh, as we grow more and more at larger scale, we deplete the soils, yields go down, and we say, oh, yields are going down, we need to grow more food. As we grow more and more at larger scales, we're growing fewer and fewer crops. You know, the top seven or eight crops is three quarters of the world's calories. Huge scale, huge concentration, monocultures, biodiversity loss, yields go down. And we say, oh, we've got to grow more food, etc. Uh, as we make food more available and cheaper, it becomes economically rational to waste it. So many people waste it. Uh, and that emissions, etc., drive more climate change, blah, blah, blah. As we grow more and more crops of the same sorts, everybody in the world eats more or less the same thing. So our diets are converging. More calories available than nutrition. Nutrition's expensive, calories are cheap. That's driving that kind of global convergence of diets. As we grow more and more crops at larger and larger scale, it's economically possible to feed grain to livestock, so that makes meat cheaper. We have more meat in the, on the planet, more livestock, and of course, that contributes to unhealthy diets in some ways, but it also drives climate change. And as we drive climate change, God, this is exhausting. As we drive climate change, it's reducing the nutrient content of the grains because of the way the plants are growing, etc., etc. Uh, which underlines the nutrition crisis. So we've designed this system, and wherever you look at this system, every time we drive it a bit harder, it makes things worse. And we've got to get to the point, and in the sort of political discourse that many of us are involved in, there is this recognition that our food system now needs changing. So that's the kind of food system. It's not just an incremental, how do we change a little bit here or a little bit there? We have to change things quite radically. <clears throat> So, just thinking, my brief, uh, about the risks to the food system as we look ahead. Now, in the traditional literature, risks are a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. So, in a kind of traditional climate change sense, you'd say, well, hazard, extreme rainfall. Exposure is, will you get flooded? Vulnerability is, are you vulnerable to that flood? Or can you build flood defences or whatever? The world, of course, is much more complicated. Hazards 
from environmental change are multivariate. So on this slide, we know that there's a kind of gradual onset issue of climate change. The patterns of the climate, the average weather, if you like, is changing. We can adapt to that. We know extreme weather is becoming more common. Our models of predicting that extreme weather, weather are perhaps an order of magnitude under representing the speed with which that extreme weather is coming about. We know next to nothing, well, we know lots of stuff, but we can't predict the behaviour of the jet stream. And the behaviour of the jet stream determines in the UK the large-scale weather patterns, the blocking, the droughts, the extreme heat, and, and so on. So we can't really look ahead and say, well, what will our climate be in the UK? We can look ahead and say we can estimate our climate, but we can't do it with any precision. We have an absolutely tiny grasp on whether or not there are going to be large-scale changes in the climate system, tipping points. And we have absolutely no science predictive ability at all about how climate change is going to impact on ecology. And that sounds dull and boring and a kind of middle-class, nice-to-have biodiversity, what does it matter? But as we mix up ecosystems... Animals and plants will start living together, are starting to living together in different ways, and we expect more diseases to emerge. And if you look at the emergence of uh, uh, new zoonotic diseases over the last 40 years, it's going up fast. COVID, SARS, MERS, even back to HIV, etc. So as climate change is impacting on ecology, we're going to get more pests and diseases, some of which will directly affect farming systems, some of them will affect us. But we can't predict it. We have no, no ability to do that. Then exposure. Exposure is not just whether or not it's going to rain on you or you're going to get caught in a fire. Exposure is also whether or not your economy, our food system, is globally embedded. Where do we get our supplies from? How much can they be disrupted by something that happens overseas? If there is a flood knocking out the port of Shanghai, through which a third of Chinese goods come, that will have enormous consequences for the rest of the economy. We import so much of our food, events happening overseas will really make a, potentially make a difference to our food systems. And then our vulnerability is not just about our global embeddedness, that's our exposure, it's whether or not our supply chains are resilient. Are they just in time? Are they just in case? We're doing more just in caseness. In the old days, just in timeness was the number one priority, so then when something goes wrong, our food security gets threatened in the UK. But, of course, these latter two things, exposure and vulnerability, are complex functions of the political and social environment in which we live. So this year, 20, last year, 2022, we had COVID, uh, possibly related to biodiversity rewiring, ecological rewiring due to environmental change. We had extreme weather, and we had the invasion of, by Russia of Ukraine, perhaps in order to maximise their... Uh, economic returns from being masters of the food system within Europe, owning a large breadbasket region as a failing petrostate or a petrostate that's going down. Those sorts of tensions around the ability to control politically, economically, global food chains are going to rise up the agenda. So as we look ahead, it's not just the weather, it is also the political and geopolitical tensions that will affect the way the market works that become germane as the noose titans, in a way, ensuring your national security and your ability to control your supply chains is going to become much more important. And that's going to add to geopolitical tensions, which is going to add to market <laughs> shocks, which is going to drive things in different ways. Um, and this is a, just a figure for how uh, external shocks, some of the climate impacts, but they can affect... Uh, going along here, international trade, they can affect stability conflict, they can affect finance and business, and they can affect any part of the world. It doesn't have to be what's happening in the UK that will affect the UK food system. And uh, again, many of you will have heard me talk about this before. If you think back to 2010, we had a drought heat wave in Ukraine and Western Russia that interdicted grain about the same order of magnitude as Odessa, did last year. That drove up food prices. Those food prices we felt in terms of rising in food insecurity in the UK, but they also created conditions that led to food riots in 20 or 30 countries around the world, sparked off the Arab Spring. Arab Spring in turn led to the geopolitical reconfiguration of the Middle East, flow of migrants into Europe, 
helped contribute to the rise of populism, inward-looking nationalism, etc., blah, 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 contributed to the dynamics that led to Brexit. So that was one event in 2010 has led to a cascade lasting a decade that has reshaped the world in which we live. So as we look ahead, as we expect more and more of these shocks to come along, we need to get uh, smarter about these. So just coming towards the end, um, we know extremes are going up. We know that our global interconnectedness is going up. We know that risks, global interconnected risks, are going up. We know everything's going up in terms of the hazards, the exposure, and our vulnerability. So the shocks to our food system are going to get more and more painful. I think I'll skip over this. And I'll skip over this. So going back to my first slide, if we are going to transform our food system and make it better for people on the planet... That involves not just resilience building. That involves getting our diets right for people. And if we get our diets right for people, that also contrib contributes to sustainability in terms of uh, it will largely be a lower footprint diet because it's um, one which is uh, healthy, diverse, lots of um, fruit and vegetables, much less uh, ultra-processed food, uh, uh, lower amounts of meat, smaller footprints as a whole. The challenge is, the transition challenge, at the moment we do not incentivise, because of the way that we've constructed this food system, we do not incentivise growing the right sorts of things in the right places in the right ways. We've got all of the incentives that are associated with producing grain as cheaply as possible and a grain-based food system. So when you look at what we should be growing, if everyone was to eat a healthy diet... We only grow a third of the fruit and vegetables in the world that we should. We grow 50% too many cereals. We grow four times too much oil, about 12 times too much sugar, etc., on a global basis. All of our incentives are wrong. And so we need to think about how we can work with politicians, work with global trading system, work with the multilateral system to get market restructuring right so that the incentives are in the right places. The cold chains are there. The infrastructure is right. The taxes are there to make the food that people ought to be eating more available and cheaper, and the food that they ought not to be eating less available and more expensive. But of course, that requires a radical change in the way that politicians think about our food system as well as uh, the international trade system. So, summary. world is increasingly tu tuna, turbulent, uncertain, novel, ambiguous... Turbulent, it's changing, it's uncertain because you can't predict what's going to happen. It's novel, you're going to throw new things at us all the time. And it's ambiguous in the sense that there's never going to be a right thing to do. There are always wicked decisions and trade-offs. Risk cascades are coming, becoming more common, ecological rewilding, blah, 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 blah. So we need to transform the food system from a biodiversity perspective, from a health perspective, from a sustainability perspective, from a climate perspective, from a soils perspective, from a pollution perspective, from a livelihoods perspective. We are just talking, to, just talking to Alan. Farmers can't make enough money to grow food at the moment, even with all of the downward pressure on prices, etc. Farmer livelihoods suffer. Food insecurity suffers. The poorest suffer. And everybody ends up eating crap diets because they're the cheapest possible. So if we got it right, we would reduce the volatility in the system, guarantee better long-term returns. We'd have more st stability in supply chains and markets, more predictability, which for many people would be a good thing. We'd have fewer existential threats to business models. If we go into a situation where 2023 is repeated in 24, 25, 26, what will happen to multinational corporations if the world fragments into a conflicted, contested, multipolar world where we don't have a kind of global trade system anymore because we're always fighting with each other and contesting with each other? What will happen to business models? We've got to change. We're going to keep them going. If we get our diets right, our workforce is better, our workforce is healthier, productivity goes up, people's mental health improves because the climate risks go down and some of those the anxieties uh, uh, decrease. And then when it comes to the point of today's meeting, investors, of course, play a huge role in this. They control some of the behaviour of the big cor corporations. Laura and I 
uh, writing a report about the role of um, uh, big business in food system transformation at the moment. Investors play an important role in some of those businesses and the decisions. But investors as a community are part of the big family of agents in the food system that can drive change politically. Say, say to government, we welcome the opportunity to change. Change can, won't happen ourselves. It won't happen with one business suddenly leaping into the unknown. Change will only happen when everybody chooses to move simultaneously, and that requires community level de-risking of first mover disadvantages and so on. So the voice of the investor community becomes very important in driving some of the, the politics of this, I think. And <coughs> that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.